Welcome to another episode of Too Close to Home, the series where we dig up creepy stories, haunted places, and mysteries from our very own Patreon's hometowns. This episode we're looking at Hannah, A, Becky, Dave, and Catherine, and do we have some good stories in store for you five? Remember everyone, if you want us to dig up stories from your area, head on over to our Patreon and join our Too Close to Home tier. Thank you everyone for supporting us. And now, we'd personally like to say to Hannah, A, Becky, Dave, and Catherine, hit those lights, sit back, and enjoy. A. Our valued patron from Albuquerque wishes to remain anonymous, so we will call them A, but they know who they are. Albuquerque is the largest city in New Mexico, and a place that has a few claims to fame. It is home to one of the largest aerial tramways in the world that stretches 2.7 miles from the northeast edge of the city to Sandia Peak on the ridgeline of the Sandia Mountains. It also boasts several magnificent museums and historical buildings and is known for its spectacular international balloon fiesta. As you would expect with any city, it has its fair share of murder and mystery, and for you A, we'll first look at the baffling disappearance of Billy and Mary Lou Senna. 11-year-old Billy Senna and his nine-year-old cousin, Mary Lou, were last seen on September 22nd, 1979, as they played on their bikes in the area of Edith Road and the 300 block of Mountain Road in the Martinez town neighborhood of Albuquerque at around 10 a.m. outside of Mary Lou's home. They reportedly then said they were going to go to the post office to play on the grass, not too unusual when you consider the dry environment of the city. After this, however, the children never returned home and were never seen again. The case was initially handled by the local police department as an accident. Investigators briefly suspected that the children had locked themselves in a railroad car as they played. However, security officers for Santa Fe Railway failed to find Mary Lou or Billy, or any sign of their presence. Authorities then began to treat the case as an abduction. There was no physical evidence discovered during the investigation, and witness reports were non-existent. Not even neighbors and relatives could shed light on the terrifying disappearance of the children. Over the years, authorities continued to receive tips about the case, although so far, none have panned out. There has also been no shortage of theories about what may have happened to Billy and Mary Lou. Officer Nadine Hamby of the Albuquerque PD revealed in 2010 that investigators received word that during the 1980s, a man was abducting children from state fairs, and notably, Billy and Mary Lou vanished while a state fair was operating. However, this man was caught in Kansas City and cleared of being involved with the disappearance of the Senna children. Another rumor stated that the pair were killed and buried in a garden in Martinez town, although there has never been any evidence found to prove this theory. In 2004, a woman living in the children's old neighborhood reported hearing children's voices coming from the basement of the home where Billy and Mary Lou once lived. Using this information, the police brought in cadaver dogs to search the basement area only, and the canines sent something. However, investigators never dug up the flooring because of safety concerns. The case was officially reopened in 2010. One year later, Mary Lou and Billy's former home were searched completely this time, although scent dogs picked up nothing, and no evidence was discovered. This same year, the police revealed that they had identified a possible suspect, Michael Cordova. Billy's sister Sarah recalled the name Cordova was their mother's boyfriend at the time of the disappearance. She stated that he was possibly a drug dealer as he grew a lot of marijuana in the back garden. Authorities have theorized that Cordova staged the abduction and killed the children after some of his cannabis disappeared. Sarah stated that Billy was horrifically beaten after the event 
as Cordova automatically blamed the 11-year-old for his missing plants. Police stated that they only had Cordova's name to run with, as back in the 1970s, it was not common practice to take other details, such as date of birth and social security number. As Cordova is such a common name, they have hundreds of results when searching for him. They are also searching for a woman named Lisa, or Lisa Ramirez, who lived in the house at the time of the disappearance. There have been few updates in this case since. Many of the children's relatives have died in the years since they vanished, although Billy's sister Sarah continues to look for answers along with Mary Lou's mother. Billy Senna was just 11 years old when he vanished. He is described as a Hispanic male with brown hair and eyes, and when he was last seen, he was 4 foot 8, 650 pounds, and wore a t-shirt and black trousers. He also has a birthmark on his left shoulder blade, and a strawberry birthmark under his ribs on the right side of his back. If he is alive, he'll be 54 years old. Mary Lucena was just 9 when she disappeared. She is described as a Hispanic female with black hair and brown eyes, and when she was last seen, she wore a red halter top stood at 5 foot 4 and weighed 50 pounds. If she is still alive, she'll be 52. Next, we'll take a look at the Haunted Chemo Theatre. The Chemo Theatre is located on the northeast corner of Central Avenue and 5th Street in Albuquerque. It opened in 1927 during the glory years of silent movies, and over the years featured such stars as Gloria Swanson and Ginger Rogers. However, tragedy struck in 1951 when a six-year-old boy named Bobby Darnell was killed when the boiler in the basement exploded, demolishing part of the original lobby. Bobby had been sitting in the theatre balcony with his friends when he became frightened by something on the screen and ran down the staircase to the lobby where the boiler exploded, killing him instantly. But it seems the spirit of Bobby never left, and to this day, he haunts the building. He is known to play all sorts of pranks on staff and guests, and is often seen playing on the lobby staircase, wearing a striped shirt and blue jeans. Bobby is known to disrupt performances by tripping up the performers and moving props. To appease his spirit, the cast hang donuts on the water pipe that runs along the back wall behind the stage. Often, the treats are gone the next morning, and those that are left have bite marks made by a small mouth. It is claimed that one year, staff were preparing for a Christmas production and took down the stale donuts. This proved to be a huge mistake, and rehearsal became a technical disaster with everything malfunctioning. However, as soon as the donuts were replaced, things began to run smoothly again. Another ghost said to haunt the theater is that of an unknown lady who is seen walking along the hallways, wearing an old-fashioned bonnet. She is not disruptive like Bobby, she just goes about her business not disturbing anyone. After fire destroyed much of the theater in 1963, it fell into disrepair, but was saved in 1977 by the citizens of Albuquerque and is now restored and serves as a performing art theater. We'd love to know, A, if you've ever visited, and if so, did you feel anything supernatural in the building? Halakalani, New South Wales. Halakalani is a suburb of Central Coast in New South Wales, Australia, located around 50 miles from Sydney. Its unusual name derives from the Hawaiian word meaning house befitting heaven, and it shares its name with an oceanfront luxury hotel located on Waikiki Beach in Honolulu. Our valued patron Dave is lucky enough to live there, and for you Dave, we move a little way down the road to Jenny Dixon Beach. Jenny Dixon Beach is no stranger to dangerous and devastating events. The area was christened Jenny Dixon Beach after a ship named the Janet Dixon ran aground in 1870. Nobody was fatally injured during the incident, but it certainly left its mark on those aboard the ship and on the locals in the area. But the real legend of the beach comes from a tale set in the 1970s. As the story goes, one night a teenage girl making her way home from work attempted to hitchhike and was given a lift by a group of young men. But things took a turn when instead of giving her a ride home, the men beat and sexually assaulted her. She was discovered barely alive amongst the brush at Jenny Dixon Beach, but later died due to the intensity of her injuries. On her deathbed, she told her father that she wouldn't rest until the men were found and punished. While no one was ever charged with the crime, 
The five men began to die off one at a time under strange circumstances during the following year. The girl began appearing as a spirit not far from Nora Head Cemetery just after she was buried. Shortly afterwards, one of the young men took his own life, complaining to a friend that he was being harassed by an apparition. Later that year, another of the young men was killed in a car crash. At the scene, before he died, he claimed someone had walked in front of his vehicle, but no other witnesses present at the time could support this allegation. A third man drove his vehicle off a cliff, again after being harassed by a supposed spirit. The next man picked up a hitchhiker on Wilfred Barrett Drive, but she vanished from his car, and thereafter he began to show signs of insanity. He later ran his car off a highway and died. Like the other men involved in the crime, the fifth perpetrator spoke of being continuously haunted and took his own life after he began seeing things. Over the years, there have been many reports of individuals, including police officers, picking up a young female hitchhiker only for her to vanish shortly after the drive begins. She reportedly only sits in the back seat and bizarrely leaves behind a lit cigarette. Another ghost to haunt the beach is believed to be from the 1800s due to her type of clothing. There is some speculation that she is a woman who drowned in a shipwreck before the lighthouse was eventually built and that she is possibly looking for her son who was swept overboard. The stories of the hauntings are so intriguing that an audio engineer named Christopher Halling filmed a movie about the events. The film, Jenny Dixon Beach, was released in 2011, the creepiest place in Australia. Morissette is located just outside of Halakalani and is the location of Morissette Hospital for the Insane. It took in its first patients in 1909. In its early years, the dormitories couldn't be built fast enough to accommodate the influx of patients, and construction continued into the 1920s, and in 1930, a separate walled compound called Waii Bay Jail was built to house the criminally insane, containing two maximum security wards, wards 21 and 22. However, by the 1980s, the populations had declined, and wards were closed, and eventually the Waii Bay Jail was abandoned and although other parts of the hospital are still used today, other parts of the hospital are now in ruins and have become a magnet for urban explorers. Ward 21, known as the Crim, is particularly creepy, and although there are no specific ghost stories about the building, it certainly saw some misery in its day, and the now just crumbling graffiti-strewn walls offer an extremely creepy vibe. We wonder if you've ever set foot in there, Dave. Not that we'd advise it. Enfield, London. Enfield is a large town in North London, England, and is the hometown of our much valued patron, Catherine. It's probably best known to paranormal fans as the place where the infamous Enfield poltergeist incident happened. The alleged activity at 284 Green Street occurred between 1977 and 1979, and centered around the young Hodgson sisters, who witnessed furniture moving, objects being thrown, and children levitating. The story attracted press coverage in British newspapers and has since been dramatised in television and radio documentaries, culminating in the 2016 horror film The Conjuring 2, although some believe the whole thing was an elaborate hoax. We've covered the story several times on Top 5s, so instead for Catherine, we'll be looking at two other cases, starting with the vanishing of Elizabeth Canning. On January 1st, 1753, an 18-year-old maidservant named Elizabeth Canning strangely vanished, nowhere to be found for almost a month. She had told her mother that she was going to visit her aunt and uncle and left her family home in Aldermanbury, London. 28 days after she disappeared, she returned to her mother. She was starved, dirty and dishevelled and claimed that she'd been held in a room in Enfield, London against her will. Elizabeth reported that she was assaulted in Moorsfield by two men. She was robbed of half a guinea and three shillings, and several items of clothing were taken. She was then bound and hit over her head before she was taken to a house in Enfield, where she was confronted by two girls and a woman. Elizabeth alleged that the woman wanted her to join them in sex work, but she refused. She was then forced into the attic and locked in, 
Here, she was given very little food and clothed herself with items she found by the fireplace. She was able to flee the house by loosening the board that was nailed to the window. Upon her return home, Elizabeth was checked over by a doctor who stated that her body had indeed been starved. However, there were many skeptics who simply didn't believe the young woman's story. The woman whose property Elizabeth was taken to was named Susanna Wells, and she denied having ever met or seen Elizabeth before and protested her innocence. One of the girls who'd been present in the house initially backed up Elizabeth's story, but later recanted this confession. Furthermore, the woman who supposedly asked Elizabeth to join her as a sex worker, Mary Squires, had several alibis for the day of Elizabeth's disappearance, although many other individuals swore that they'd seen her in Enfield that day. Still, Elizabeth was tried and convicted of perjury, and she was sentenced to seven years' transportation. A skeptical judge who hadn't believed her story and had carried out a private investigation into the matter. He didn't believe Elizabeth had survived on such little food and found the story of her escape highly unlikely. Following her conviction, Susanna Wells and Mary Squires were pardoned and released. To this day, it's unclear what truly happened to Elizabeth during the 28 days that she vanished, and it's unknown if she did lie, and if so, why. Once she was exiled to America, Elizabeth remarried and had four children. She died in 1773, her story still shrouded in mystery. Next, we'll take a look at the Rose and Crown at Clay Hill. This old-fashioned public house was once owned by the grandfather of infamous highwayman Dick Turpin, and it's claimed that Dick sometimes used the building to hide out after committing his violent crimes. For years, it's rumoured that Dick Turpin and his horse Bess have returned in death to haunt the old pub, and both staff and visitors have witnessed his ghostly apparition lurking outside along with rusty steeds. Lastly, we'll take a look at Forty Hall, Forty Hall is a 1600s manor house in Forty Hill, Enfield, that was built within the grounds of a former Tudor palace called Alzing Palace. The exact location of the palace was unknown until excavations were carried out in the 1960s. Forty Hall today is used as a museum, but for many years, visitors to the historic building have experienced an array of paranormal activity. Visitors have reported an eerie feeling in the building as if they are being watched or followed by an unseen presence. The first floor landing is the most haunted, as well as what locals call Rain Tom's bedroom. At one time, the room was sealed off to the public, but staff would often find the bedsheets disheveled, as if someone had slept in them. Catherine, we'd love to know if you've ever been to the Rose and Crown, or Forty Hall, and if so, did you experience anything strange at either of them? Bradenton, Florida. Bradenton is a city in Florida on the Manatee River. It is the birthplace of horse surfing and is home to the oldest working fishing village in Florida. It also happens to be the hometown of our valued patron Hannah. For you, Hannah, we'll start with an unsolved disappearance followed by a good old fashioned haunting. Tamara Elizabeth Toy was last seen in Bradenton, Florida on May 6, 2006. Her family last spoke to her in March that year, when she had a phone conversation with her son, and she sent her other children greeting cards for Easter. The last positive sighting of the 44-year-old was when she paid her rent. At the time of her disappearance, Tamara was living at an inn with her boyfriend, Glenn Bivens. The pair were unemployed and had only recently moved to the area. Most of Tamara's family lived out of state, with only her sister residing in Florida. Before their move to Bradenton, they were living in a mobile home in Lake Placid. Tamara had a difficult life at the time of her disappearance. She had four children and was once married, and was praised for her work as a nurse. However, her life spiralled out of control after she injured her back and became addicted to prescription painkillers. She also had a history of cocaine abuse. Bivens, who was 44, was arrested a week after Tamara was last seen, on May 13th. He had almost hit a police officer's vehicle outside of the inn, and notably, he was alone. Tamara was not in their room. Bivens had a previous criminal record and had spent 15 years behind bars in Arizona. 
His rap sheet included convictions for possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, resisting arrest with violence, and possession of cocaine and prescription medication with intent to sell. Five days after his arrest, he took his own life by jumping from a second floor balcony in jail and hitting the tile flooring below. During this time, investigators struggled to contact Tamara's family members, as she only had Bivens listed as her next of kin, despite seeming to be on relatively good terms with her loved ones. Notably, while Tamara had no criminal record in Manatee County, there was an outstanding warrant for her arrest for leaving the scene of an accident in Indiana River County, which led investigators to theorize that perhaps the 44-year-old was on the run and didn't want to be found. However, the prevailing theory is that Bivens was responsible for Tamara's death, or at least the disposal of her body. Before he took his own life, Bivens reportedly told another inmate that Tamara had died of a drug overdose, and he'd buried her body in eastern Manatee County. While he provided no further details, and this account has never been confirmed, several strange and incriminating pieces of evidence were discovered in Bivens' vehicle when he was arrested including two dirty shovels, a ski mask, garbage bags, and a blood-stained glove. The back seat of his van had also been removed at the time. Authorities soon learned that on May 7, 2006, a man named Stephen Cherrick began paying rent for Tamara's room. He had a criminal record and was living with Tamara and her boyfriend at the time of her disappearance. He denies being involved or knowing anything about what happened to the 44-year-old but her family believe he has answers. Tamara Toy was last seen on May 6, 2006. She is described as a white female with brown hair and blue eyes, although her hair was dyed blonde at the time of her disappearance. She had surgical scars on her back from screw insertion and a tattoo of ivy on her lower back. Tamara also has a caesarean scar on her abdomen. She is five foot six, and she was last seen weighing about 140 to 150 pounds. If she is still alive, she'll be 61. Braden Castle Braden Castle has a grim history. It was built by Dr. Joseph Addison Braden in the 1800s, and he used slave labor to construct it. In the mid 1800s, Seminoles unsuccessfully attacked the castle, and it was subsequently destroyed by fire in 1903. All that remains today are its ruins, and an unknown apparition who terrorizes trespassers. But for years, ghost stories have circulated about the property, and on many occasions, campers have told how they have heard strange sounds emanating from where the castle once stood. One account happened whilst the castle was still standing but abandoned. Three men were camping near the castle after bringing supplies up the river. As the three men sat by the fireside, they started to talk about the castle ghosts, and decided to go to the castle and investigate for themselves. They collected some log splinters, which they planned to light as torches when they entered the dark building. With torches ablaze, they entered the empty structure. The old furniture that still remained cast creepy shadows into the dimly lit rooms. After exploring downstairs, they climbed up an old stepladder to the upper level. That's when the noises started. One of the men begged for them not to continue, but the other two were determined to carry on. As soon as they reached the top, they heard footsteps. Room by room, they searched for the alleged ghost. Finally, in the last room, they could hear something breathing heavily, and in the corner, they could see a mysterious shape in the darkness. They continued on a little further, finally able to perceive the fierce creature that had been tormenting campers for over half a decade. It was the biggest old billy goat the men had ever seen, it turned out a local man named Will Vanderbrip let his goat run free and owned the great creature. It just proves that sometimes there is a plausible explanation for the rumors. Today, all that remains of the castle are a few crumbled walls, along with an unknown apparition who allegedly terrorizes any trespassers. Hannah, have you ever been near this area? And if so, what was your experience? St. Paul, Minnesota. St. Paul is the capital of the US state of Minnesota and is the hometown of our patron Becky. It has also been the hometown of some pretty famous people. 
Author F. Scott Fitzgerald was born there, and Peanuts creator Charles Schultz grew up there. Amelia Earhart also lived in the Summit Hill area while attending St. Paul's Central High School. First, we're going to take a look at the creepy Griggs Mansion. This 24-room, four-story, immaculately built, maintained Victorian-era home, located on Summit Avenue in St. Paul, Minnesota, is believed to be one of the city's most haunted buildings. Built in 1883, its creator lived within its walls for just four years before selling it and moving on. Over the course of the last century, the mansion has been converted into an art school, and at one time was even split into numerous apartments. But in recent years, it has been bought and sectioned into three properties. Interestingly, despite being worth almost $2 million, it last sold for just $1.1 million, because the severity of the hauntings put off many interested buyers. It's believed that six or seven entities reside in the home, including military men, a young child and teenager, and former workers on the estate. In the early 20th century, the spirit of a suicidal maid appeared to a young servant and a butler. She is believed to have taken her own life in 1915 at the top of the mansion, and that climbing the staircase leading to her noose gives people extreme anxiety, distress, and a sense of foreboding. One news team reporting on the mansion's spooks and scares even fled the scene after sensing her presence due to the immense feeling of dread they experienced while filming. Another notable spirit was first reported by a teacher back when the mansion was an art school. Dr. Dalma Kolb lived in the building's basement during the 1950s. He awoke one night in a cold sweat to the feeling of two ice-cold fingers on his forehead. He turned on his light and saw a blue flash. Two nights later, he saw the apparition known as the Thin Man at the bottom of his bed. The man, sharply dressed in a black suit and top hat, vanished through the wall afterwards. The Thin Man would later be seen in the 1960s on several occasions by the owner at that time. In later years, a St. Paul medium named Roma Harris visited the home. He found the presence of a teenager named Amy, who had spent time in the mansion and had only happy memories of the home, where she played the piano. Roma also encountered a Civil War officer dressed in a general's blue uniform. Interestingly, the mansion's builder, Chancy Griggs, was a Civil War officer. It's been suggested that he likes to keep his eye on things and remains attached to the house even after all this time. While it does not appear that the mansion is open today to tourists and paranormal enthusiasts, it is still reportedly very haunted and is frequently visited by ghosts. It has now been split into three separate units which can be leased, presumably for a rather hefty sum. Now from ghosts to serial killers, we'll take a look at the weepy voiced killer. On December 31st, 1980, Paul Stefani beat Karen Potak in St. Paul, inflicting severe wounds and brain injury. After the attack, Stefani called the police and directed them to the location of his victim. Karen survived, but suffered life-changing injuries. Less than six months later, Stefani went a step further and killed 18-year-old student Kimberly Compton in Minneapolis. After killing her, he again contacted the police, this time pleading, God damn, will you find me? I just stabbed somebody with an ice pick. I can't stop myself. I keep killing somebody. His pathetic, pleading voice earned him the name, the weepy-voiced killer. Two days later, he called the police again, saying he was going to turn himself in, but he didn't. Instead, he killed again. His next victim was Kathleen Greening, who was found dead at her home just outside St. Paul. Stefani had drowned her in her bathtub. His last victim was 40-year-old nurse Barbara Simmons, who Stefani had met in a bar in Minneapolis. He offered to drive her home, and she was found stabbed the next day. Stefani contacted the police saying, Please don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry I killed that girl. I stabbed her 40 times. Kimberly Compton was the first one over in St. Paul. Stefani was finally apprehended in August 1982 after he attacked 19-year-old Dennis Williams with a screwdriver. Her cries for help drew the attention of a local man, causing Stefani to flee the scene. Stefani was injured during the attack and sought medical help, 
It was this call that confirmed that he was the weepy voiced killer and linked him to the Williams attack. Initially, Stefani was convicted of Barbara Simmons' murder and the attempted murder of Denise Williams and was sentenced to 40 years. However, when he was diagnosed with cancer in 1997, he confessed to killing Kim Compton and Kathy Greening. He died in prison a year later. So that's it for this episode of Too Close to Home. We hope you enjoyed, and we'd like to say a massive thank you to Hannah, A, Becky, Dave, and Catherine. We hope you enjoyed these stories from your hometown. And remember everyone, if you'd like to be featured in an episode of Too Close to Home, head on over to Patreon for more information. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.